Well, welcome everybody. We're glad to have you today. It is February 22nd, and we've got a good group right here live, and we are going to uh, open the Word of God, and we're glad that you've joined us. Uh, let me just say this about some things, some hiccups we're trying to work through um, with our uh, postings. If you uh, don't see a, a Sunday morning service when you think you should be able to after, after it's been recorded, hang in there. Uh, there's just a, a few different things we have to learn about how to get that to the website now, but they will always be on YouTube. So if you were to go to FSB Camden, you're going to get our YouTube channel. If you go to, and, and probably what you're going to see when you get there, you might just see the Wednesdays and you're thinking, well, where's the Sunday morning services? If you go to live, they're all there. You just click on live and you'll see every service that takes place on Sunday morning. So. That's one way to get around uh, if there's a delay, okay? So thank you for tuning in. Um, just a little bit of what we can pray for today. Uh, I'm sure most of you have, are continuing to follow uh, the Asbury revivals. Uh, uh, Ainsley Earhart was there from Fox, and uh, just she's a believer, born again Christian, and it was interesting to, to hear her take. Uh, they had limited, because of space, in the evenings, um, 18 to 25-year-olds. So what, what, what they were saying was that uh, this revival, uh, God is moving in the hearts of a lot of young people. So they're, they're, they're saying that if you're not between 18 and 25 in the evening, you don't get in. Wouldn't that be something? Uh, and say, well, I'm, I'm just 61. And, uh, but Ainsley Earhart said the only reason they let her in is because she was with Fox. And uh, so there is a revival movement, not just there, but in many other places. So Sunday morning, I'm going to step out of Proverbs, and I'm going to preach. We're going to look at revival. We're going to look at Ezekiel 37, and most likely we'll move to Acts 5. But uh, it's interesting uh, to listen and to even, even hear what preachers have to say about it. Um, I'm just glad that everybody can be the judge of everything that happens. Uh, and, we have, and here's what I love. One preacher said this, instead of being critics of revival, let's be cheerleaders. Amen. And that's a good word. That's a good word. So let's pray, okay? Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for folks that love your word. I'm grateful for uh, those that filled in in my absence, and I'm glad to be home. So uh, just have your way. Lead us, guide us, direct us. Help us to rightly divide the word of truth this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, I want you to uh, take your Bible and turn to Colossians chapter 2. Realize we didn't have 1030 last week. I appreciate Tim Fritchie stepping in, taking care of the 630. And we're thankful for those that continue to serve faithfully in our kids' ministries on Wednesday night. Would people consider you a mature Christian? Do you know any older folks that are babies? Do you know any teenagers that supposedly had matured, but they act like babies? Um, do you know any young people that seem to be uh, mature beyond their age? I think we all do. Uh, well, it's important as a believer that we grow, that we mature in our faith. And sadly, sometimes the fruit of that in our lives is not clear. So Paul, when he addresses the church of Colossae, he talks about the importance of growing and maturing in your faith. Um, when you get to chapter 2, one commentator said that we now recognize the great need of the church is for mature people who are consistently growing in the Lord. Um, consistent. Consistent. Do you know anybody that's um, that in a Christian faith, they, they sprint and then they walk? They sprint, then they walk. They're all in for a few weeks and then disappear for a few months. Unfortunately, that can be a characteristic of the Christian life. But that's not a mark of a mature Christian. Consistency. Consistency is. And if it were not for consistency, we would be in trouble as a church. 
uh, Sunday school teachers, uh, volunteers on Wednesday night, nursery workers, we just say, I'm not coming and, and just burn everybody uh, because of their lack of faithfulness. So as we grow in our faith, we're called to be consistent, consistently growing in the Lord. Um, I was gone last week from Wednesday, uh, got home Saturday evening. Um, Cody was scheduled to preach. Uh, Cody was not scheduled to do the funeral for me. And I was grateful that he stepped in and took care of that uh, in the needs of Jay's family. Um, but uh, let me just give you a little background of, of where I was. I was about an hour and a half west of Jacksonville, Florida with David Burton Ministries, Board of Directors. Uh, on a 750-acre ranch. Now, I don't know if you can put that in your mind. That's a big place. Um, beautiful lodge kind of setting. Uh, there were seven total of us there. Nobody else was on the whole place. And uh, it was a glimpse of isolation that was unbelievably quiet. And I think that uh, that's something that, uh, that I've missed a little bit in my own life. And it kind of challenged me to want to take advantage of those times better here. So let's begin. I'm going to read the first seven verses of Colossians chapter 2. Uh, keep in mind that Paul was not the pastor of the church of Colossae. Epaphras was. So Paul is writing them and he's encouraging them. And we'll pick it up. Chapter 2, verse 1. For I want you to know what a great conflict, okay? Does anybody have a different translation than New King James? Okay, struggle, all right? For I want you to know what a great struggle, a conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea. As for many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in what? Love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. And as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. And I'll just read the, these last few verses because the challenge for uh, the church was the... the the belief of the Gnostic that there was a special revelation. And here's what uh, Paul was reminding them. Verse 8, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality, and power. Now, let's, let's just jump right back to verse 1, okay? Uh, for I want you to know what a great conflict. So I mentioned that word uh, means struggle. It's where uh, the original, it's where you get the word agonize, okay? Agony, all right? So in essence, Paul is saying uh, he is struggling, um, and, and this is a battle. I wrestle in prayer for believers uh, of the church. Do you ever wrestle in prayer for your kids? I, I imagine all of us would say we do or we have. And, and when you see your kids hurt, you hurt. Uh, when, you, when you see your grandkids mistreated, you, you hurt for them. And uh, Paul, the picture here is that if we're going to mature in Christ, listen to me. A mature people must have mature leadership who struggle in prayer and who struggle in concern for them. Um, tomorrow morning, I have the privilege 
um, some of you saw this on the prayer chain. Uh, my mom and dad's senior pastor, John um, Seagraves, who ministers to the senior adults there, uh, they have something every Thursday called Classics at Mandalia. And uh, my parents are real active in it. And John and Gloria will bury their 51-year-old son, Mark, Friday. Um, and he has asked me to step in tomorrow and, and teach the classics. And I'm going to use this passage because he loves those folks and shepherds them well. And it's their time to be there for them. Um, you know, it's one thing to pray over somebody who's getting ready to have surgery. Uh, Ron Bowling is in surgery as we speak. It's another thing when they're willing you out and you're the one getting ready to be put to sleep. Amen. And I think a lot of times in leadership, we can spend all of our time preparing to do it for somebody else but there has to be times when you recognize the same thing you teach and the same thing you lead is sufficient in your hour of need, in your moment of crisis. Now, the church of Laodicea uh, was, was an interesting picture that Jesus paints uh, in the book of Revelation. Um, let, me, let me just go to it. Uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. Jesus said to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write this. These things says the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning, the, the creator the, of the creation of God. He says, I know your works, that you're neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot, but you're lukewarm neither cold nor hot, and I will vomit you out of my mouth. The church of Laodicea was at a point where perhaps they were just going through the motions. And I believe sometimes when we come to worship, I do believe sometimes we go through the motions. I think sometimes uh, we're, we're distracted from the things of the world. Um, Sunday morning... Uh, when uh, Cody dismissed Children's Church, I went over there and did some fun stuff with the guitar. Uh, Renee was leading it, and we had a little fun. So when I came back in, not to be a, a distraction to everybody else, I sat in the second to the back row over there. That's a different perspective for me. Uh, when you sit on the wings, you can see everything. You're looking across the sanctuary. When you're looking across the sanctuary, oftentimes you're not looking. I don't want to sound bad. That's a preacher. That doesn't sound right. But distractions are real. Um, Tina mentioned to me before we started, make sure your phone is, she's right. There, that's, a, that's a lonely feeling to, to start a service and realize you've got your phone in your pocket. And then, or a funeral and wonder if it's on vibrate or wonder if it's not going to be a distraction. Um, you know, riding a plane the other day, they said, make sure you put your plane in airplane mode. But my understanding is you can still do things on your phone even in airplane mode. Uh, um, you can function. Um, we cannot function wholeheartedly distracted. And uh, I, I do want to encourage you Sunday morning to be in prayer for the message because we're going to look at, at revival. And, and as I've told the group here, um, it's amazing to listen to a lot of preachers act like, uh, is this really of God or is it not of God? Who or who's, uh, let the Word of God answer that question. Amen. Not, not us, but the Word of God. And, and we should, as we've mentioned not be critics of revival. We pray for it. We should be cheerleaders of what God wants to do. Actually, this church should be cheerleaders of what God's doing in any church. Praise, praise the Lord when somebody shares with you what's going on in their place. Somebody's getting saved. Uh, just God is doing something fresh. We ought to praise the Lord for what's going on. And uh, that's what we're going to do as a church. 
So his concern was, uh, I've got this conflict for you. I'm struggling because uh, maturity is, is an important thing when it comes to uh, serving the Lord. Um, ministers are to wrestle for their people, for their sheep. Shepherds are to wrestle over their sheep. Um, a mature church has to have mature leadership. Half-hearted, half-hearted commitment becomes obvious pretty quick. It becomes obvious pretty quick. All in for the glory of God. So he uses this word agony, ag- where we get agony, agonize. I'm agonizing over this. It's the picture of an athlete giving every ounce of energy he has in the contest, and it's a struggle, but he's giving it all. And that's, that's what Paul did. He labored hard. I sat down on the airplane. I don't think I, I didn't share this Sunday, did I? Did I say anything about the trip Sunday? I don't want to repeat if I do. Uh, I find myself repeating things, and I'm sorry for that, church. Uh, but uh, sat down on an airplane coming from Jacksonville to Atlanta. A couple, uh, she was in the middle, he was against the window, I was on the aisle. Introduced herself, ple- pleasantry, shook hands. And then it came to the point of where I was from. And I said, I'm from Camden, Ohio. And he immediately says, I've been to Camden, Ohio. I said, no, you've not been to this one. And he said, yes, I have. I have hunted in, in uh, Camden, Ohio. I said, do you know the name of the farm? And he said, yeah, it was the Rubush farm. Rubush is a Camden name. And uh, what are the odds of that? What are the odds of that? God's plan. And God's plan for us as a church isn't just to always come and sit in the airplane seat and not have conversation with those around us, but His call is for us to grow as we receive, as His Word is planted, and it flourishes in the life of His people. Paul wrestled in prayer. Uh, and I'm going to tell you something. Recognize that prayer is a spiritual battle. Recognize that the devil will do whatever he want, whatever he can, not at whatever he wants, whatever he can to distract you from prayer. Uh, whether it be uh, your schedule is so busy you don't have time to pray, I've got news for you. Everybody has the same amount of minutes in a day. The fact might be that you're juggling your minutes rather than uh, orchestrating them. Um, there, uh, maybe you've been on the end of this. Uh, normally on Tuesday is when I prepare for Sunday. And um, I wish I could say that I'm like these guys that are so sharp, they plan their messages six months out, and they're, they're ahead of the game, boom, boom. I'm not, I'm not that talented, okay? And the Holy Spirit sometimes will change directions. Um, so Tuesday, Judy, Judy knows. So if you were to come to church and Judy said he's working on his message, that's not because she, of disrespect for anybody. That's out of respect for preparing. Um, a, lot, a lot of my buddies, they, they, they work on their sermons at home. I, I don't need to do that. Uh, not yet. Um, but I'm grateful. You know, Judy's got that old uh, motel manager, uh, hotel manager mentality. And, and she, she can kind of get mean with people. And I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But she's not afraid, she's not afraid to draw a line, and I'm grateful for that. Um, the minister or believer who seriously knows that a struggle is real, uh, let, me, let me give you some things that can cause us to wonder. Our thought life. Our thought life. Jesus knew what people were thinking No human could handle that. Uh, Our imaginations, our pride. uh, How about something pressing in your life? You know, some pressure that you're going through. Uh, Demanding work. Uh, Maybe our health. Uh, And and we recognize that if we're going to gain victory, then we've got to let God have these things. And we've got to agonize. We've got to struggle. We've got to recognize it's worth it. Okay, listen to what the Bible says. 
in regards to prayer. Matthew 7, 7. Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened. Could it be that sometimes we're not asking, we're not seeking, uh, we're not even knocking, Amen. and we're wondering what God's up to? The Bible says in Matthew chapter 26, Watch and pray, Jesus said, that you enter not into temptation. The spirit is willing, but we have a battle against what? The flesh. The flesh. The flesh is weak. So here's the first thing. Number one, five marks of a, of a mature church. The first one is this. Mark number one is a minister and a leader who struggles in prayer and concern. How in the world should I expect our church to pray if I don't pray? How in the world would you expect your Sunday school class to pray if we're, we as leaders aren't leading that direction? Okay? Does anybody know uh, in the group that's here, any of you remember someone in your life that you love to hear pray? Okay. Amen. Anybody else? Okay, your dad. I love to hear my dad pray. Um, there used to be a deacon at a church I went to named Joe Hedrick. Just an encourager. He wasn't loud. He wasn't loud. He was humble. He was humble. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Um, the other day as seven of us sat there in, in Florida... Uh, we, we talked about when we got saved and, and who God used to, to teach us and to lead us. And, and, and names just began to go around the circle. And I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if the Lord tarries and we're gone one day to have our name mentioned in a circle by somebody like Kirk Pike? Is he still alive, Bill? Or he? Yes, he is. Okay. He, he's back at Blue Bethel and he's doing well. Okay. Um, Paul writes these words in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Pray always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watch with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And then he says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Look at verses 2 and 3. That their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Knowledge. Here's the second thing that a, a mature church is marked by. You ready? People who possess confidence and assurance. Now, I heard this this morning from David Jeremiah, and, and I agree with him. David Jeremiah said that he doesn't believe there are too many Christians who have never doubted something in their life. But I want to remind you that just because you doubt something doesn't mean you've lost your salvation. Just because you doubt doesn't mean that it's not true. Just because you doubt doesn't mean that you have to understand everything that happens on earth. Right. Cody was in 1 Corinthians 13 Sunday. That verse 13, 12, now we look through a mirror dimly. So if a mirror is sitting here, if you were to touch a mirror, you're not touching yourself. You're touching a reflection of it, but that's not you. You can hit that mirror all you want. Now we see through a mirror, but then we'll see face to face. So there's coming a day where all of it will make sense. There's coming a day where we'll, we'll see the whole picture and recognize that God had a plan even though my finite mind and eyes couldn't understand it at the time. Um, Tina, do you remember Donna at Woodland Country Manor? One of, Donna Settle, one of the leaders. Her office was right there off the main fellowship hall. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Um, uh, she called me last week 
and asked me if I would be willing to do a funeral for a 51-year-old mother who's left a 17-year-old son very close to the family. How do you explain to a 17-year-old boy why his 51-year-old mom's gone? We may not understand it, but there's a God who sees it, and there's a God who's allowed it, and there's a God who loves us, even in the midst of our uncertainty. Jeannie, I imagine many times after Bill passed, you've asked the question, why? But God is faithful. See, a mature people uh, have assurance in their hearts. Doesn't mean we understand everything. Doesn't mean we have it all together. What it means is that the Lord is in charge. Um, that their hearts may be encouraged. That their hearts may be comforted. Does that sound familiar? Uh, the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the comforter. That's what God does. So God encourages us. He stirs confidence in us. He braces us to withstand when the winds of the world are pushing hard. Uh, he, he helps us stand when the trials of life come and there's no reason. He helps us with assurance knowing that he's with us now and one day heaven will be our home. Amen. Uh, one writer said strong hearts come from love. Strong hearts come from love from being knit together with others in love. Um, the Bible says that David and Jonathan, their souls were knit together. Um, and sometimes, I don't know about you, but sometimes we can feel alone. Sometimes we can feel like we're without friends. Sometimes we can feel left out. Sometimes we can feel ignored. Sometimes we can feel unloved. And that might happen even from somebody who is a blood relative of you. Sometimes we can feel neglected. Sometimes we can feel bypassed, overlooked, and uncared for. And a person who feels these emotions, listen, that person's not going to live a life of assurance. They're not going to live a life of assurance. On the contrary, they, they, they probably feel weak, unacceptable, or maybe even insecure. So what's the answer? Paul says it that their hearts, I pray this, I struggle with this, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge and the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. Strong hearts doesn't come from religion. Strong hearts doesn't come from ceremony or liturgy, ritual, rules, laws. Strong hearts come from love. They come from love, and that's the good news of the gospel. Assurance comes from knowing what you believe, that God exists, that God really is in control, uh, that God is really interested in daily lives. Um, I'm, I'm just really amazed at the response of the secular world to Asbury Revival. And then look at some of the response of the Christian world. The secular world's almost like something is happening. And the Christian almost seems to say, it's not real. Should we not, as believers, say, praise the Lord for what He's doing and He's chosen the the now generation to be part of it. So this Friday, uh, the Jesus Revolution movie starts. Um, it's the story of Chuck Smith. Um, the Jesus movement back in the late 60s, early 70s, started on the West Coast. Chuck Smith was an old preacher. Uh, Calvary Chapel uh, had always been faithful, preaching the gospel, uh, but he was a little older, like me. And God brings him this young hippie preacher who begins to preach and young people begin to listen. Uh, I don't think it's any coincidence that this movie is opening Friday night. 
based on what we see happening. God is the orchestrator of his will, of what he wants to accomplish. The mystery of God, the Bible says. Look at uh, the end of verse 2. To the knowledge of the mystery of God. To most people, God is a mystery. But that's not what it means here. Mystery, a, a secret of God that he's now revealing. And I want, to, I want you to recognize something this, this morning, that Jesus revealed who God is. When people looked at Jesus, they were looking at God in the flesh. The critical fact is the mystery of God uh, is now revealed. Is now revealed. Verse 3. In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And I say this lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. He says, for though I'm absent in the flesh, yet I'm with you in the spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. And as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. So walk in him. Mark 1 uh, is a minister who struggles in prayer and concern. I've got uh, Mark 1 for 2, don't I? Mark 2, which I have Mark 1, means to possess confidence and assurance. Mark 3, a mature people that resist deception. That was the whole thing that Paul was dealing with. The people were being deceived. False teaching. A mature people have to recognize deception. Um, there's a word here in verse 4. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you or beguile you. That means to mislead. It means to delude, uh, deceive, to cheat, to seduce, to lead somebody astray. And, and note how the seduction takes place in verse 4. With persuasive words. With persuasive words. Uh, I, if I can talk you into anything, the devil can talk you out of it. But when the Holy Spirit moves, you can't argue with the changed life. And that's the ex exciting thing about revival. I mean, believers can be seduced by uh, persuasive or elegant words that, in essence, could be false teaching. Uh, so what's the litmus test for us? The Word of God. The Word of God. You're going to find out real quick what somebody's theology is when you ask them, who is Jesus Christ? He's God in flesh, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died a, a vicarious death on a cross for my sin was beaten and nailed and buried and on three days rose from the grave, ascended to the Father in heaven and says, I'm coming back in like manner someday, making intercession for us. He's our high priest. When we pray to the Father, listen, it goes through Jesus. Uh, the world's beguiled and, and even false teaching can try to pull the believer astray. Um, and it might be an argument against creation. It might be an argument that uh, I'm my own man, I'm my own woman, and I can define who I am, and I can define, uh, I can define a different gender for myself. That's the world in which we live. Um, it might be somebody arguing that there's another way to be saved. It could be an argument against this perfect sinless life. It could be an argument against the substitutionary death or the resurrection of Jesus. And we're not saved by grace through faith. It could be an argument that heaven is real, but hell's not. And everybody's going to heaven when they die. Folks, that's contrary to Scripture. I don't say that out of love. If you're, if you're just telling people that everybody goes to heaven when they die, you're not, you're not sharing a, a message of love. You're sharing, you're sharing a message of, of wishful thinking. The Bible says we're all sinners separated from God, and the good news is Jesus died to bridge the gap so that we could go to heaven. 
So you come to him by faith. And I'm looking at a small group here this morning and somebody's watching, but you remember when you gave your life to Christ, we may have all come different directions to get to the point of receiving Christ, but we all came the same way to God and that was by faith in what Jesus did on the cross. Amen. Hey, I tell you what's hard to believe. If the Lord tarries, today is the 22nd. We are bearing down on the end of February. Now, let me repeat my philosophy the older I get. Every day it is not snowing in February is one day closer to spring. <laughs> and every day that you live as a Christian, listen to me, you're one step closer to heaven. That's right. Now, I want, to ask, I want to ask you sitting here, do you really believe that Jesus is coming? We are closer to the return of Christ than anybody in human history because we're alive. We're alive. I love what one preacher said, then God must have thought you were something pretty special to die on a cross for you and let you be living today. Somebody needs to hear your story. Somebody needs to hear you share with them why, why this, this thing called Christianity and why Jesus is so wonderful. If I were to ask that question, Brother Greg, why, why, why is Jesus so wonderful? I would say because He first loved me. He knows everything about me, everything I've ever said, everything I've ever thought. Man, I'm telling you, if getting to heaven was based on that, I'm in trouble. But the good news is, is He died for it. And He paid for it. And I praise Him for it. Here's Mark number 4. A mature people maintain discipline and are steadfast. Steadfast means you don't quit when it gets tough. Um, uh, you march in step. You follow the captain. Uh, it means to persevere, that you're immovable, you're steady, you can be counted on. Um, it's a military word. A.T. Robertson wrote that it's the solid part of the line which can, can and does stand the attack. And when other places break, it's the one that will be there. It's the one that you can count on. So Paul writes that the Colossian church was being attacked. He says you've got to be steadfast. One of my favorite verses, write this down. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. You ready? So you might be here today or you might be watching and feel just a little discouraged or a little weary, tired. Paul writes, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in what? Vain. Vain. Amen. If I were to paraphrase this, here it is. Paul says, it will be worth it. It'll be worth it after a while. It'll be worth it after a while. Um, let me read one verse, and I'll give you the last point, and we'll, we'll finish. Romans 8, 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The sufferings of this present time. This present time, I, if the Lord tarries, and let's say we all live to be 90, and that won't be the case, but let's just say the Lord blesses us all with this long life. That is a drip, a drop in the bucket compared to eternity. Okay? And then I'll close with number five. A mature people, mark number five, a mature people walk in the Lord. They walk in the Lord. Verse six, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. Okay? They receive Christ by faith, so they continue to walk with the Lord. They trusted in His righteousness, His payment was sufficient, and they continue to walk and trust Him, right? Listen, we trust His righteousness, the cross paid for it. We trust in His resurrection, that He overcame death, and we trust that one thing, because of our faith in what Jesus did, that is acceptable to God, and one day heaven will be our home.
There's nothing within ourselves to earn it, merit it, deserve it, or get God to accept us. That comes by way of faith in Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. That's right. Man, I can't understand what's going on in the world. Seems like the world is crazy. We walk by faith, not by sight. And one day, our faith will become sight. Right. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. If, I don't know, if somebody's watching this, and you've never given your life to Christ, we'd love to talk to you about that. And the good news is, uh, forgiveness is a prayer away. Most people sitting here, uh, there have been times in their lives when they've asked Christ to forgive them, as I did myself as a 14-year-old boy, come into my heart, I believe that you died for me. So I want to encourage you. Make sure you place your faith in Christ. Let's bow our heads. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for your word. And even today, help us to walk and to serve you and to be consistent. Lord, help us to have assurance and confidence. Uh, Lord, help us to be leaders. And, and uh, Lord, help me to be a pastor who struggles and is concerned about our people. Lord, help us to resist deception and help us to, to be steadfast in this thing called life. We pray for a church family. God, we pray for the things that will take place tonight, and we pray for those that are hurting. I pray for Ron as he gets through this surgery. I pray for Anita Sackenheim. God, encourage her heart. And we love you today. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. Brother Greg. Mm-hmm.